And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat upon him was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with the beasts of the earth. Book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 8. There have been many related sequential coincidences all throughout my life, incidents that by themselves would have led nowhere. Statistically, the odds against the same are a related sequence of events happening to one individual are astronomically high. It is this series of incidents that have convinced me that God has had a hand in my life. I do not believe in fate. I do not believe in accidents. I cannot and will not accept the theory that long sequences of unrelated accidents determine world events. It is inconceivable that those with power and wealth would not band together with a common bond, a common interest, and a long-range plan to decide and direct the future of the world. For those with the resources to do otherwise would be totally irresponsible. I know that I would be the first to organize a conspiracy to control the outcome of the future if I were such a person and a conspiracy did not yet exist. I would do it in an attempt to ensure the survival of the principles in which I believe, the survival of my family, my survival, and the survival of the human race, if for no other reason. I believe, therefore, that a grand game of chess is being played on a level that we can barely imagine, and we are the pawns. Pawns are valuable only under certain circumstances, and are frequently sacrificed to gain an advantage. Anyone who has studied military strategy is familiar with the concept of sacrifice. Those who have seriously studied history have probably discovered the real reason we go to war on a regularly scheduled basis. My research has shown, at this point, that the future laid out for us may be just about impossible to change. I do not agree with the means by which the powerful few have chosen for us to reach the end. I do not agree that the end is where we should end at all. But unless we can wake the people from their sleep, Nothing short of civil war will stop the planned outcome. I base that statement not on defeatism, but on the apathy of the majority of the American people. Twenty-five years ago, I would have believed otherwise. But twenty-five years ago, I was also sound asleep. We have been taught lies. Reality is not at all what we perceive it to be. We cannot survive any longer by hanging on to the falsehoods of the past. Reality must be discerned at all costs if we are to be a part of the future. Truth must prevail in all instances, no matter who it hurts or helps, if we are to continue to live upon this earth. At this point, what we want may no longer matter. It is what we must do to ensure our survival that counts. The old way is in the certain process of destruction, and a new world order is beating down the door. I fear for the little ones, the innocents, who are already paying for our mistakes. There exists a great army of occupationally orphaned children. They are attending government-controlled daycare centers. There are latchkey kids who are running wild in the streets, and the lopsided, emotionally wounded children of single welfare mothers, born only for the sake of more money in the monthly check. Open your eyes and look at them, for they are the future. In them I see the sure and certain destruction of this once proud nation. In their vacant eyes I see the death of freedom. They carry with them a great emptiness and someone will surely pay a great price for their suffering. If we do not act in concert with each other and ensure that the future becomes what we need it to be, 
then we will surely deserve whatever fate awaits us. I believe with all my heart that God put me in places and in positions throughout my life so that I would be able to deliver this warning to His people. I pray that I have been worthy and that I have done my job. From the time a person leaves its mother's womb, its every effort is directed toward building, maintaining, and withdrawing into artificial wombs, various sorts of substitute protective devices or shells. The objective of these artificial wombs is to provide a stable environment for both stable and unstable activity, to provide a shelter for the evolutionary processes of growth and maturity, in effect, survival to provide security for freedom, and to provide defensive protection for offensive activity. This is equally true of both the general public and the elite. However, there is a definite difference in the way each of these classes go about the solution of problems. The primary reason why the individual citizens of a country create a political structure is a subconscious wish or desire to perpetuate their own dependency relationship of childhood. Simply put, they want a human god to eliminate all risk from their life, pat them on the head, kiss their bruises, put a chicken on every dinner table, clothe their bodies, tuck them into bed at night, and tell them that everything will be all right when they wake up in the morning. This public demand is incredible, so the human god, the politician, meets incredibility with incredibility by promising the world and delivering nothing. So who is the bigger liar, the public or the godfather? This public behavior is surrender born of fear, laziness, and expediency. It is the basis of the welfare state as a strategic weapon, useful against a disgusting public. Most people want to be able to subdue and or kill other human beings which disturb their daily lives, but they do not want to have to cope with the moral and religious issues which such an overt act on their part might raise. Therefore, they assign the dirty work to others, including their own children, so as to keep the blood off their own hands. They rave about the humane treatment of animals, and then sit down to a delicious hamburger from a whitewashed slaughterhouse down the street and out of sight. But even more hypocritical, they pay taxes to finance a professional association of hitmen, collectively called politicians, and then complain about corruption in government. Again, most people want to be free to do things, but they are afraid to fail. The fear of failure is manifested in irresponsibility, and especially in delegating those personal responsibilities to others where success is uncertain or carries possible or created liabilities which the person is not prepared to accept. They want authority, but they will not accept responsibility or liability, so they hire politicians to face reality for them. The people hire the politicians so that the people can, one, obtain security without managing it. Two, obtain action without thinking about it. Three, inflict theft, injury, and death upon others without having to contemplate either life or death. Four, avoid responsibility for their own intentions. Five, obtain the benefits of reality and science without exerting themselves in the discipline of facing or learning either of these things. They give the politicians the power to create and manage a war machine to, one, provide for the survival of the nation womb, two, prevent encroachment of anything upon the nation womb, three, destroy the enemy who threatens the nation womb, or destroy those citizens of their own country who do not conform for the sake of stability of the nation womb. Politicians hold many quasi-military jobs, the lowest being the police which are soldiers, the attorneys and the CPAs next who are spies and saboteurs. 
and the judges who shout the orders and run the closed Union military shop for whatever the market will bear. The generals are industrialists. The presidential level of commander-in-chief is shared by the international bankers. The people know that they have created this farce and financed it with their own taxes, but they would rather knuckle under than be the hypocrite. Thus a nation becomes divided into two very distinct parts, a docile subnation and a political subnation. The political subnation remains attached to the docile subnation, tolerates it, and leeches its substance until it grows strong enough to detach itself and then devour its parent. Human beings are machines, levers which may be grasped and turned, and there is little real difference between automating a society and automating a shoe factory. Factor 1. As in every social system approach, stability is achieved only by understanding and accounting for human nature. A failure to do so can be, and usually is, disastrous. As in other human social schemes, one form or another of intimidation, or incentive, is essential to the success of the draft. Physical principles of action and reaction must be applied to both internal and external subsystems. To secure the draft, individual brainwashing, programming, and both the family unit and the peer group must be engaged and brought under control. Factor 2. Father. The man of the household must be housebroken to ensure that Junior will grow up with the right social training and attitudes. The advertising media, etc., are engaged to see to it that father-to-be is compliant before or by the time he is married. He is taught that he either conforms to the social notch cut out for him, or his sex life will be hobbled, and his tender companionship will be zero. He is made to see that women demand security more than logical, principled, or honorable behavior. By the time his son must go to war, father with jelly for a backbone, will slam a gun into Junior's hand before father will risk the censure of his peers or make a hypocrite of himself by crossing the investment he has in his own personal opinion or self-esteem. Junior will go to war, or father will be embarrassed. So Junior will go to war, the true purpose notwithstanding. Factor 3 mother. The female element of human society is ruled by emotion first and logic second. In the battle between logic and imagination, imagination always wins. Fantasy prevails. Maternal instinct dominates so that the child comes first and the future comes second. A woman with a newborn baby is too starry-eyed to see a wealthy man's cannon fodder or a cheap source of slave labor. A woman must, however, be conditioned to accept the transition to reality when it comes or sooner. As the transition becomes more difficult to manage, the family unit must be carefully disintegrated and state-controlled public education and state-operated child care centers must become more common and legally enforced so as to begin the detachment of the child from the mother and father at an earlier age. Inoculation of behavioral drugs can speed the transition for the child. Factor 4. Junior. The emotional pressure for self-preservation during the time of war and the self-serving attitude of the common herd that have an option to avoid the battlefield is all of the pressure finally necessary to propel Johnny off to war. Their quiet blackmailings of him are the threats, no sacrifice, no friends, no glory, no girlfriend. Factor 5. Sister and what about Junior's sister? She is given all the good things of life by her father and taught to expect the same from her future husband regardless of the price. Factor 6. 
cattle. Those who will not use their brains are no better off than those who have no brains. And so this mindless school of jellyfish, father, mother, son, and daughter, become useful beasts of burden or trainers of the same. So now you know. You can see every step that the elite have taken in their war to control this once great nation. You can see the steps that will be taken in the future. You can no longer pretend innocence. Your denial of the conspiracy will fall on deaf ears. This tape is part of the education that will give Americans the weapons needed in the coming months and years of hardship as the New World Order struggles to be born. Truths cannot be negated or shrugged away. The message is this. You must accept that you have been cattle, and the ultimate consequence of being cattle, which is slavery. Or you must prepare to fight, and if necessary, die to preserve your God-given right to freedom. History is replete with whispers of secret societies, accounts of elders or priests who guarded the forbidden knowledge of ancient peoples, prominent men meeting in secret, who directed the course of civilization, are recorded in the writings of all people. The oldest is the Brotherhood of the Snake, also called the Brotherhood of the Dragon, and it still exists under many different names. The Brotherhood of the Snake is devoted to guarding the secrets of the ages and to the recognition of Lucifer as the one and only true God. If you do not believe in God, Lucifer, or Satan, you must understand that there are great masses of people who do. I do not believe in racism, but millions do, and their beliefs and actions based upon those beliefs will affect me. It is clear that religion has always played a significant role in the course of these organizations. Communication with a higher source, often divine, is a familiar claim in all but a few. The secrets of these groups are thought to be so profound that only a chosen, well-educated few are able to understand and use them. These men use their special knowledge for the benefit of all mankind. At least, that is what they claim. But how are we to know, since their knowledge and actions have been secret? Fortunately, some of it has become public knowledge. Secret societies mirror many facets of ordinary life. There is always an exclusivity of membership, with the resultant importance attached to being or becoming a member. This is found in all human endeavors, even those which are not secret, such as football teams or country clubs. This exclusivity of membership is actually one of the secret society's most powerful weapons. There is the use of signs, passwords, and other tools. These have always performed valuable functions in man's organizations everywhere. The stated reason, almost always different from the real reason, for the society's existence is important. It can be anything, but is usually fraternal, and is found in all pressure groups wherever people congregate. The most potent tool of any secret society is the ritual and myth surrounding initiation. These special binding ceremonies have very deep meaning for the participants. Initiation performs several functions which make up the heart and soul of any true secret society. Like boot camp, the initiation into the armed forces, important aspects of human thought that are universally compelling are merged to train and maintain the efforts of a group of people to operate in a certain direction. Initiation bonds the members together in mysticism. Neophytes gain knowledge of a secret, giving them special status. The ancient meaning of neophyte is planted anew or reborn. A higher initiation is, in reality, a promotion inspiring loyalty and the desire to move up to the next rung. The goals of the society are reinforced, causing the initiated to act toward those goals in everyday life. 
That brings about a change in the political and social action of the member. The change is always in the best interest of the goals of the leaders of the secret society. The leaders are called adepts. This can best be illustrated by the soldier trained to follow orders without thinking. The result is often the wounding or death of the soldier for the realization of the commander's goal, which may or may not be good for the overall community. Initiation is a means of rewarding ambitious men who can be trusted. You will notice that the higher the degree of initiation, the fewer the members who possess the degree. This is not because the other members are not ambitious, but because a process of very careful selection is being conducted. A point is reached where no effort is good enough without a pull up by the higher members. Most members never proceed beyond this point and never learn the real, secret purpose of the group. The frozen member from that point on serves only as a part of the political power base, as indeed he has always done. You may have guessed by now that initiation is a way to determine who can and cannot be trusted. A method of deciding exactly who is to become an adept may be decided during initiation by asking the candidate to spit upon the Christian cross. If the candidate refuses, the members congratulate him and tell him, You have made the right choice, as a true adept would never do such a terrible thing. The newly initiated might find it disconcerting, however, that he or she never advances any higher. If instead the candidate spits upon the cross, he or she has demonstrated a knowledge of one of the mysteries and soon will find him or herself a candidate for the next higher level. The mystery is that religion is but a tool to control the masses. Knowledge or wisdom is their only God through which man himself will become God. Man's desire to be one of the elect is something that no power on earth has been able to lessen, let alone destroy. It is one of the secrets of secret societies. It is what gives them a political base and lots of clout. Members often vote the same, and to give each other preference in daily business, legal, and social activities. It is the deepest desire of many to be able to say, I belong to the elect. The first secret that one must know to even begin to understand the mysteries is that their members believe that there are but few truly mature minds in the world. They believe that those minds belong exclusively to them. The philosophy that follows is the classic secret society view of humanity. When a person of strong intellect is confronted with a problem which calls for the use of reasoning faculties, they keep their poise and attempt to reach a solution by garnering facts bearing upon the question. On the other hand, those who are immature when confronted by the same problem are overwhelmed. While the former may be said to be qualified to solve the mystery of their own destiny, the latter must be led like a bunch of animals and taught in the simplest language. Like sheep, they are totally dependent upon the shepherd. The able intellect is taught the mysteries and the esoteric spiritual truths. The masses are taught the literal, exoteric interpretations. While the masses worship the five senses, the select few observe, recognizing in the gulf between them the symbolic concretions of great abstract truths. The elect are given knowledge of the mysteries and are illumined, and are thus known as the Illuminati, or the Illuminated Ones the guardians of the secrets of the ages. Three early secret societies that can be directly connected to a modern descendant are the cults of Roshaniya, Mithras, 
and their counterpart, the Builders. They have many things in common with the Freemasons of today, as well as with many other branches of the Illuminati. For instance, common to the Brotherhood are the symbolic rebirth into a new life without going through the portal of death during initiation, reference to the lion and the grip of the lion's paw in the Master Mason's degree. The three degrees, which is the same as the ancient Masonic rites before the many other degrees were added, the latter of seven rungs, men only, and the all-seeing eye. Of special interest is the powerful society in Afghanistan in ancient times called the Roshania, illuminated one. There are actually references to this mystical cult going back through history to the House of Wisdom at Cairo. The major tenets of this cult were the abolition of private property, the elimination of religion, the elimination of nation-states, the belief that illumination emanated from the Supreme Being who desired a class of perfect men and women to carry out the organization and direction of the world, belief in a plan to reshape the social system of the world by first taking control of individual countries one by one, and the belief that after reaching the fourth degree, one could communicate directly with the unknown supervisors who had imparted knowledge to initiates throughout the ages. Wise men will again recognize the Brotherhood. Can you hear the echo of the Nazi Party, the Communist Party, the extreme right and the extreme left? The important fact to remember is that the leaders of both the right and the left are a small, hard core of men who have been and still are Illuminists or members of the Brotherhood. They may have been or may be members of the Christian or Jewish religions, but that is only to further their own ends. They are, and always have been, Luciferian and internationalist. They give allegiance to no particular nation, although they have used, on occasion, nationalism to further their causes. Their only concern is to gain greater economic and political power. The ultimate objective of the leaders of both groups is identical. They are determined to win for themselves undisputed control of the wealth, natural resources, and manpower of the entire planet. They intend to turn the world into their conception of a Luciferian totalitarian socialist state. In the process, they will eliminate all Christians, Jews, and atheists. You have just learned one, but only one, of the great mysteries. I hope to show that most modern secret societies, and especially those that practice degrees of initiation, and that is the key, are really one society with one purpose. You may call them whatever you wish, the order of the quest the Jason Society, the Roshania, the Kabbalah, the Knights Templar, the Knights of Malta, the Knights of Columbus, the Jesuits, the Masons, the ancient and mystical order of Rosai Crusai, the Illuminati, the Nazi Party, the Communist Party, the executive members of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Group, the Brotherhood of the Dragon, the Rosicrucians, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberg Group, the Open Friendly Secret Society of the Vatican, the Russell Trust, the Skull and Bones, the Scroll and Key, the Order. They are all the same, and all work toward the same ultimate goal, a new world order. Many of them, however, disagree on exactly who will rule this new world order, and that is what causes them to sometimes pull in opposite directions while nevertheless proceeding toward the same goal. The Trilateral Commission is an elite group of some 300 very prominent business, political, and intellectual decision-makers of Western Europe, North America, and Japan. 
This enterprise is a private agency that works to build up political and economic cooperation among the three regions. Its grand design, which it no longer hides, is a new world order. A key to the danger presented by the Trilateral Commission is its seminal piece, written for them by Harvard professor Samuel P. Huntington in the mid-70s. In the paper, Professor Huntington recommended that democracy and economic development be discarded as outdated ideas. He wrote the following as co-author of the book Crises in Democracy. We have come to recognize that there are potential desirable limits to economic growth. There are also potentially desirable limits to the indefinite extension of political democracy. A government which lacks authority will have little ability short of cataclysmic crises to impose on its people the sacrifices which may be necessary. Look at the Council on Foreign Relations. Many members, in fact the majority, never serve on the executive committees. They never go through any initiation of any kind. They are, in fact, the power base and are used to gain a consensus of opinion. The majority are not really members, but are made to feel as if they are. In reality, they are being used, and are unwilling or unable to understand. The executive committee is an inner core of intimate associates, members of a secret society called the Order of the Quest, also known as the Jason Society devoted to a common purpose. The members are an outer circle on whom the inner core acts by personal persuasion, patronage, and social pressure. That is how they bought Henry Kissinger. Rockefeller gave Kissinger a grant of $50,000 in the early 50s, a fortune in those days, and made dear old Henry a member of the CFR. Anyone in the outer circle who does not toe the mark is summarily expelled, and the lesson is not lost on those who remain. Do you remember the human desire to be a member of the elect? That is the principle at work. The Council on Foreign Relations has been the foremost flank of America's foreign policy establishment for more than half a century. The Council on Foreign Relations is a private organization of business executives, scholars, and political leaders that studies global problems and plays a key role in developing United States foreign policy. The CFR is one of the most powerful semi-official groups concerned with America's role in international affairs. It is controlled by an elect group of men recruited from the Skull and Bones and the Scroll and Key societies of Harvard and Yale, which are both chapters of a secret branch of the Illuminati known as Chapter 322 of the Order. The members of the Order make up the Executive Committee of the Council on Foreign Relations after undergoing initiation into the Order of the Quest, also known as the Jason Society. The Council on Foreign Relations is an offshoot sister organization to the British Royal Institute of International Affairs. Their goal is a new world order. Although it existed as a dinner club in New York, it did not take on its present power until 1921 when it merged with the Royal Institute of International Affairs and received its financial base from J.P. Morgan, the Carnegie Endowment, the Rockefeller family, and other Wall Street banking interests. The Council on Foreign Relations controls our government. Through the years, its members have infiltrated the entire executive branch, State Department, Justice Department, Central Intelligence Agency, and the top ranks of the military. Every director of the Central Intelligence Agency has been a member of the CFR. Most presidents since Roosevelt have been members. The members of the CFR dominate ownership of the press, and most, 
if not all, of America's top journalists are members. The CFR does not conform to government policy. The government conforms to CFR policy. I read top-secret documents while with naval intelligence that stated that President Eisenhower had appointed six of the executive committee members of the CFR to sit on the panel called Majesty 12, also known as Majority 12, for security reasons. Majesty 12 is the secret group that is supposed to control extraterrestrial information and projects. The document stated that Eisenhower had also appointed six members from the executive branch of government who were also members of the CFR. The total membership of Majesty 12 was 19, including Dr. Edward Teller and the six members from the Jason Scientific Group. Again, whether this is true or disinformation depends solely upon the existence of aliens. The CFR is a secret society in that it forbids the taking of notes or the publishing of minutes of its meetings. Any member who divulges the subject or any part of any conversation or talk that took place during a meeting is terminated. The goal of the Council on Foreign Relations is a new world order. Remember, never worship a leader. If you worship a leader, you then no longer have the ability to recognize when you have been deceived. The most powerful secret organization in the world is the Bilderberg Group, organized in 1952 and named after the hotel where its first meeting took place in 1954. The man who organized the Bilderberg Group Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands has the power to veto the Vatican's choice of any pope it selects. Prince Bernhard has this veto power because his family, the Habsburgs, are descended from the Roman emperors. Prince Bernhard is the leader of the black families. He claims descent from the house of David and thus can truly say that he is related to Jesus. Prince Bernhard, with the help of the CIA, brought the hidden ruling body of the Illuminati into public knowledge as the Bilderberg Group. This is the official alliance that makes up the world governing body. The core of the organization is three committees made up of 13 members each. Thus the heart of the Bilderberg Group consists of 39 total members of the Illuminati. The three committees are made up exclusively of members of all the different secret groups that make up the Illuminati, the Freemasons, the Vatican, and the Black Nobility. This committee works year-round in offices in Switzerland. It determines who is invited to the annual meeting and what policies and plans will be discussed. Every proposal or plan that has ever been discussed at an annual meeting of the Bilderberg Group has come to pass usually within one or two years following the meeting. The Bilderberg Group is directing the quiet war that is being waged against us. How can they do it? These are the men who really rule the world. Manley P. Hall, 33rd degree Mason, probably the most renowned expert on these subjects, wrote in his book, The Secret Destiny of America For more than 3,000 years, secret societies have labored to create the background of knowledge necessary to the establishment of an enlightened democracy among the nations of the world. All have continued, and they still exist, as the order of the quest. Men bound by a secret oath to labor in the cause of world democracy decided that in the American colonies they would plan the roots of a new way of life. The order of the quest was set up in America before the middle of the 17th century. Franklin spoke for the order of the quest, and most of the men who worked with him in the early days of the American Republic were also members. Not only were many of the founders of the United States government Masons, but they received aid from a secret and august body existing in Europe 
which helped them to establish this country for a particular purpose known only to the initiated few. The members of the Bilderberg Group are the most powerful financiers, industrialists, statesmen, and intellectuals who get together each year for a private conference on world affairs. The meetings provide an informal, off-the-record opportunity for international leaders to mingle and are notorious for the cloak of secrecy they are held under. The headquarters office is in The Hague in the Netherlands. The goal of the Bilderberg Group is a one-world totalitarian socialist government and economic system. Take heed, as time is running short. You must understand that secrecy is wrong. The very fact that a meeting is secret tells me that something is going on that I would not approve. Do not ever believe that grown men meet on a regular basis just to put on fancy robes, hold candles, and glad-hand each other. George Bush, when he was initiated into the skull and bones, did not lie naked in a coffin with a ribbon tied around his genitalia and yell out the details of all his sexual experiences because it was fun. He had much to gain by accepting initiation into the order, as you can now see. These men meet for important reasons, and their meetings are secret because what goes on during the meetings would not be approved by the community. The very fact that something is secret means there is something to hide. John Robeson wrote Proofs of a Conspiracy in 1798, and I believe he said it best in the following passage. Nothing is so dangerous as a mystic association, the object remaining a secret in the hands of the managers, the rest simply put a ring in their own noses, by which they may be led about at pleasure, and still panting after the secret, they are the better pleased the less they see of their way. A mystical object enables the leader to shift his ground as he pleases, and to accommodate himself to every current fashion or prejudice. This again gives him almost unlimited power, for he can make use of these prejudices to lead men by troops. He finds them already associated by their prejudices and waiting for a leader to concentrate their strength and set them in motion. And when once great bodies of men are set in motion with a creature of their fancy for a guide, even the engineer himself cannot say, Thus far shalt thou go, and no farther. Is the common man really as stupid as the elite seem to believe? If he is, then maybe the average citizen is better off ignorant, being manipulated this way and that whenever the elite deem it necessary. We will discover the answer very quickly when the common man finds that his e-ticket to fantasy land has just expired. I hope I have shown you the role of secret societies and groups within the world power structure. I hope you can see how these groups gain and keep power. You should have some understanding of how, operating in secrecy and infiltrating every level of government and vital industry, including the press, the elect manipulate the people and nations of the world toward any direction desired. I hope you caught on to the fact that the secret power structure is toward a totalitarian socialist state or fascism. It is not the Nazis, as they were a product of this power structure. It is not the Jews, although some very wealthy Jews are involved. It is not the communists, as they fit the same category as the Nazis. It is not the bankers, but they do play an important role. I also hope that you are beginning to look inside yourself to see if their reality fits. Are you getting the message? When our forefathers wrote the Constitution of these United States, they provided safeguards against despotism by providing a balance of power. The Constitution was set up to provide clear divisions of legislative, judicial, and executive powers. 
It was believed that this system would ensure that if one branch got out of hand, the other two would act to keep the one in check. This balance of power was predicated upon the assumption that none of the three branches could or would infringe upon the power of the others. The Constitution is clear on the functions of each of the branches. The legislative will make the laws. The judicial will interpret the law. The executive will decide policy and enforce the law. This, of course, is the simplest of explanations, but this is not a textbook on government. My intent is to acquaint you with simple basics of the balance of power so that you can then understand how it has been subverted. The legislature, made up of Congress in the form of the House and Senate, is required to publish the laws that are made, and this is done in the Congressional Record and the Federal Register. Pending or past legislation can be obtained by citizens through their congressmen or from the government printing office. Citizens cannot be held responsible for the law if it is not made available to them. It is paradoxical that the government body most representative of the American citizen is the one that has been the most easily subverted. Through political action committees, payoffs, pork barrel politics, professional politicians, congressmen who are members of secret societies, and through greed and fear, our representatives and senators quit representing us long ago. Congress has tremendous powers, but fails in most cases to exercise even a token amount. How is it that our legislature has allowed and at times encouraged the executive branch to write law? You probably did not know that the president and others in the executive branch of the government can and do write law. This is done in the form of presidential executive orders, National Security Council memos, National Security Decision Directives, and National Security Directives. NSC memos were broad policy papers in the days after passage of the National Security Act. NSC memos became narrower and more specific over the years, and the name has varied. Under Kennedy, they were called National Security Action Memorandums. President Bush changed the name to National Security Directives. There is a tremendous difference between Presidential Executive Orders, NSC memos, and National Security Decision Directives. Presidential Executive Orders are listed in the Federal Register, or Presidential Findings, which are made known to the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. The most important difference between the Presidential Executive Orders and all of the others, no matter what they are called, is that the others do not have to be reported, reviewed, made available to anyone, or even acknowledged that they exist. There is no oversight whatsoever that could maintain a check on the legality of these national security directives. The President and others within the executive branch have used these super-secret directives to skirt the balance of power and write law without anyone's knowledge. Justification of the President's power to write law through executive orders stems from the failure of the government to rescind the declaration of martial law during the Civil War. In effect, the United States has been under martial law ever since Lincoln's administration. These NSDs are powerful, hidden, and dangerous tools. They were prolific during the Reagan administration. Over 300 were written, with no more than 50 ever leaking out to undergo public scrutiny. Yet, most Americans have never heard of these subversive weapons. They are being used to destroy our Constitution. I believe that everyone should know about this corruption of government. Congress has turned a blind eye to these abuses of executive power. At 3.30 a.m. Saturday, August 4, 1990, 
The Senate made it even easier for the executive branch to subvert the Constitution and may have made George Bush the first American king. At that time, on that day, a minority of United States senators, maybe ten at the most, passed Senate Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 1991. The bill was fraudulently introduced as a reform to prevent future incidents of the abuses brought to light during the Iran-Contra scandal. Instead of preventing future abuses, however, it virtually authorizes essentially every abuse. The bill was carefully brought to a vote by Senator Sam Nunn in the dead of night when the opposition was gone. It effectively transfers most authority over the United States government directly into the hands of the president and thus directly into the hands of the secret government. The president was given the power to initiate war, appropriate public funds, define foreign policy goals, and decide what is important to our national security. In Oversight of Intelligence Activities, Title VII, Senate Bill 2834 authorizes the following. Gives the President power to initiate covert actions. This has never before been given to the President. Prevents Congress from stopping the President's initiation of covert actions. Allows the President to use any federal departments, agencies, or entities to operate or finance a covert operation, empowers the president to use any other nation or private contractor or person to fund or operate a covert action, redefines covert actions as operations necessary to support foreign policy objectives of the United States, a definition that is so vague and broad as to be essentially unlimited for the first time officially claims the right of the United States to secretly interfere in the internal, political, economic, or military affairs of other countries in direct and flagrant violation of international law, requires that the President prepare and deliver a written finding to the intelligence committees of the Congress, but allows the President to omit extremely sensitive matters, and authorizes the President to claim executive privilege if Congress asks too many questions. There are no penalties in the bill for violating any of its provisions, including the provision requiring a finding. Why should there be? This bill has literally handed the power of all the branches of government to the President on a silver platter. The bill effectively prevents any oversight by anyone and allows the executive branch to skirt the law and to escape accountability. This will be done using national security directives. Either National Security Decision Directive 138 or a subsequent NSD Directive on Terrorism authorized the training of three Lebanese units for preemptive strikes. When problems arose, Director of Central Intelligence William Casey took that operation off the books and enlisted Saudi Arabian help in an attempt to assassinate the head of Hezbollah. A resulting car bombing killed about 80 in Beirut. Sheikh Fadlala, the target, was unhurt. The United States military, along with civilian law enforcement teams, conducted joint anti-terrorist training across America. To allay public fears, the participants wore civilian clothing. NSD directives have become the de facto legislative vehicle of the national security state. It has become known through the research of Susan Fitzgerald, a research consultant at the Fund for Constitutional Government in Washington who has collected declassified NSD directives, that many were released without the White House letterhead at the top of the page and without the President's signature at the bottom. This, she speculates, 
is to conceal the fact that the signatures on some of them would reveal that they had been made by auto pen, not by Ronald Reagan's own hand. That should give you a taste of what we are up against. Please understand that virtually all but a very few NSD directives still remain classified, and unless the public forces disclosure, their effect will probably never be known. Somewhere within the volumes of secret NSD directives, there is a plan to suspend the Constitution of the United States of America. The existence of this plan surfaced during the Iran-Contra hearings. Congressman Jack Brooks, Democrat from Texas, attempted to bring it into the open. When he asked Colonel Oliver North directly if North had ever helped draft a plan to suspend the Constitution, Brooks was silenced by the committee chairman, Senator Daniel K. Inouye, Democrat from Hawaii. Senator Inouye stated that the subject dealt with national security, and any questions regarding the matter could be brought up during a closed-door session. We never learned the outcome. I would like to know who gave anyone, in any branch of government, with any title, the right to suspend the Constitution at any time, for any reason, under any conditions. I believe the plan to suspend the Constitution is directly tied to the underground facility called Mount Weather and to the Federal Emergency Management Agency known as FEMA. Mount Weather is so shrouded in secrecy that 99.9% .9 of Americans have never heard of it. FEMA, however, is another story. Remember Hurricane Hugo? Remember the federal agency FEMA that was sent to handle the emergency and was thrown out by the citizens because of gross incompetence? FEMA was incompetent because emergency management is just a guise for its real purpose, which is to take over local, state, and federal government in case of a national emergency. The only way FEMA could do such a thing is if the Constitution were suspended and martial law were to be declared. Therefore, its very existence is proof positive that a plan to suspend the Constitution does, in fact, exist. Just outside of a sleepy little town called Bluemont, Virginia, about 46 miles west of Washington, D.C., is an area of wilderness covering what has been called the toughest granite rock in the eastern United States. The area is surrounded by signs marked Restricted Area, and this installation has been declared a restricted area. Unauthorized entry is prohibited. Other signs state, All persons and vehicles entering hereon are liable to search. Photographing, making notes, drawings, maps, or graphic representations of this area or its activities is prohibited. Such material found in the possession of unauthorized persons will be confiscated. Internal Security Act of 1950 The installation is beneath a mountain, and its name is the Western Virginia Office of Controlled Conflict Operations. Its nickname is Mount Weather. It was ordered to be built by the Federal Civil Defense Administration, which is now the Federal Preparedness Agency. Mount Weather was designed in the early 50s as part of a civil defense program to house and protect the executive branch of the federal government. The official name was the Continuity of Government Program. Congress has repeatedly tried to discover the real purpose of Mount Weather, but so far has been unable to find out anything about this secret installation. Retired Air Force General Leslie W. Bray, director of the Federal Preparedness Agency, told the Senate Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights in September 1975. 
I am not at liberty to describe precisely what is the role and the mission and the capability that we have at Mount Weather or at any other precise location. In June 1975, Senator John Tunney, Democrat from California, chairman of the Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights, charged that Mount Weather held dossiers on at least 100,000 Americans. He later alleged that the Mount Weather computers described as the best in the world can obtain millions of pieces of additional information on the personal lives of American citizens simply by tapping the data stored at any of the other 96 federal relocation centers. I know from my stint with the Office of Naval Intelligence that these dossiers consist of information collected about American patriots, men and women who are most likely to resist the destruction of our Constitution and the formation of the totalitarian police state under the new world order. The Patriot Data Bank is constantly updated so that when the appointed hour arrives, all Patriots can be rounded up with little, if any, effort. The plan calls for this to be accomplished in the dead of night on a national holiday. The most likely holiday is Thanksgiving, when everyone, no matter the religion, race, or creed, will be at home. The targets will be ripe for the picking after a heavy meal, maybe some alcoholic beverages, and during a deep sleep. There is a traitor in the Patriot movement who provides the secret government with accurate names and addresses of Patriots who will fight to protect and defend the Constitution. My recommendation is that no Patriot should ever be at home or in the home of any family member on any holiday ever again until the traitors have been hung and the Constitution restored as the supreme law of the land. Some sources state that Mount Weather is virtually an underground city, complete with dormitories, private apartments, streets, sidewalks, cafeterias, hospitals, water purification systems, power plant, office buildings, a lake fed by fresh water from underground springs, a mass transit system, and many other astounding things. Several disturbing facts emerge when one researches Mount Weather. One is the conclusion that a complete parallel government exists at the site. Nine federal departments exist there. Agriculture, commerce, health, education, and welfare, housing and urban development, interior, labor, state, transportation, and the treasury. Apparently, at least five federal agencies are also in residence. Federal Communications Commission, Selective Service, Federal Power Commission, the Civil Service Commission, and the Veterans Administration. Two privately owned corporations have offices at Mount Weather, the Federal Reserve and the United States Post Office. There is also an office of the Presidency. What makes all this upsetting is that there is a president and a complete set of cabinet officers in residence at Mount Weather. Who are they, and who appointed them? Where is such a thing provided for in the Constitution of the United States of America? Mount Weather is the operational center, the hub of over 96 other underground federal relocation centers scattered across the United States. The majority of these appear to be concentrated in Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina. Each of these facilities contains computer data banks holding information, not on enemy agents, Soviet diplomats, or suspected terrorists, but on American citizens, patriots. A list of other files kept at the facilities was furnished to the Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights in 1975. The list included military installations, government facilities, 
communications, transportation, energy and power, agriculture, manufacturing, wholesale and retail services, manpower, financial, medical and educational institutions, sanitary facilities, population, housing, shelter, and stockpiles. The committee concluded that these databases operate with few, if any, safeguards or guidelines. Senator James Aborzek, Democrat from South Dakota, a member of the subcommittee, said, I feel the entire operation has eluded the supervision of either Congress or the courts. Chairman Tunney said, Mount Weather is out of control. Nothing was done by Congress to rectify the situation, however, and Mount Weather remains out of control. Former high-level officials from Mount Weather agree that the base at Mount Weather is much more than any standby government facility or storage center for the preservation of records. They describe it as an actual government in waiting. We do not merely store essential information. The facility attempts to duplicate the vital functions of the executive branch of the administration. As stated previously, according to my research, this includes a president and all cabinet members actually in residence. Protocol even demands that subordinates address them as Mr. President or Mr. Secretary. Most of these mysterious appointees have held their positions through several administrations. We just act on the orders of the president in national emergencies said one former Mount Weather official. The Federal Preparedness Administration, known as FPA, in its 1974 annual report stated that studies conducted at Mount Weather involve the control and management of domestic political unrest where there are material shortages such as food riots or in strike situations where the FPA determines that there are industrial disruptions and other domestic resource crises. The report states that the bureaucracy at Mount Weather invokes what it calls civil crises management. Officials who were at Mount Weather and who have furnished us with data say that during the 1960s the complex was actually prepared to assume certain governmental powers at the time of the 1961 Cuban Missile Crises and the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963. The source said that the installation used the tools of its Civil Crises Management program on a standby basis during the 1967 and 1968 urban riots and during a number of national anti-war demonstrations against the administration by the American people. Daniel J. Cronin, who was the assistant director for the FPA, outlined a massive surveillance and manipulation program that is directed against the American population on a continuing basis. The FPA has organized an impressive armament of resources and equipment. Mr. Cronin described in an interview his agency's attitude toward its wide-ranging surveillance program. We try to monitor situations, he said, and get to them before they become emergencies. No expenses spared in the monitoring program. He cited reconnaissance satellites, local and state police intelligence reports, and law enforcement agencies of the federal government as examples of the resources available to the FPA for information gathering. The only document that I was able to find that attempts to outline some of the statutory authority of Mount Weather is Executive Order 11490. It was drafted by General George A. Lincoln, former director for the Office of Emergency Preparedness, which preceded the FPA and was signed into law by President Nixon in October of 1969. Executive Order 11490 superseded Executive Order 11051, signed on October the 2nd, 
1962 by President Kennedy. Kennedy's order used the language, Whereas national preparedness must be achieved, as may be required to deal with increases in international tension with limited war or with general war, including attack upon the United States. Nixon's order began, Whereas our national security is dependent upon our ability to assure continuity of government at every level in any national emergency-type situation that might conceivably confront the nation. Nixon has deleted any reference to war, imminent attack, and general war from the order and replaced them with the phrase, during any emergency that might conceivably occur. Nixon's order, which is the one in effect today, allows the government in the form of FEMA to suspend the Constitution for literally any reason they decide to call a national emergency. I cannot find a plan or executive order anywhere which outlines any procedure or allowance for the restoration of the Constitution after a national emergency has ended. This leads to the obvious conclusion that no restoration of the Constitution is contemplated or desired by those in power. In 1975, Senator Tunney expressed concern when he said, We know from what we've heard in the press that 15,000 names were being maintained by the Federal Bureau of Investigation for detention in an emergency. We also know that the Internal Revenue Service had its files on individual taxpayers. We know that the CIA had their Operation Chaos, and that the National Security Agency has the records of conversations that have been intercepted electronically. My question is this. Is there anyone, like yourself, General Bray, that is in control of the overall access to this data if it is maintained in a relocation site? And your answer, as I understood it, is no. Then he continued. General Bray, I must say that I still don't know who's in control of these relocation centers. You say you don't have that knowledge, and still we don't know from the three witnesses that we had here today, that they had information as to who has control of those centers. I am not at liberty, Bray answered, to describe precisely what is the role and the mission and the capability that we have at Mount Weather or at any other precise location. I firmly believe that our continuity of government program has not provided continuity at all, but has been the instrument for discontinuing open and democratic government, and that the very program designed to protect Americans has actually been turned against us. There's a guy by the name of Buster Horton. He's a member of FEMA, and he's a member of the Interdepartmental Unit, which is empowered in the event of a national security emergency to become the unelected national government, a sort of FEMA secret government, so to speak. A pretext for invoking those emergency measures can be found almost daily in the newspapers. It can be anything, from the suspension of debt payments by the high bureaus of American countries to mass runs on United States commercial banks. And that's an issue, by the way, that was being handled personally by the National Security Council and Brent Scowcroft. To food shortages, to the drug war. The whole bit, anything, any disaster emergency declared at all, even including the oil spill from the Exxon tanker in Alaska, If the president had declared a national emergency, that could have triggered it. Any instability in the Middle East. Anything, in fact. And they've already tested their capabilities in April 1984 with Rex 84A. And that was designed to test the readiness of the United States civilian and military agencies to respond to serious national security crises. 
Now, the executive order that will implement this, the executive order 11051, details responsibilities to the Office of Emergency Planning, or FEMA. It gives authorization to put all executive orders into effect in times of national emergency declared by the President, increased international tension, or economical or financial crises. Note that it covers domestic crises but does not even mention war or nuclear attack. Now, the only thing that has to happen for FEMA to be able to implement all the executive orders, emergency executive orders, is for the President to declare a national emergency of any type, as long as it's a national emergency. Executive Order 10995 provides for the takeover of the communications media. Executive Order 10997 provides for the takeover of all electric, power, petroleum, gas, fuels, and minerals. Executive Order 10988 provides for the takeover of food resources and farms. Executive Order 10999 provides for the takeover of all modes of transportation, control of highways, seaports, and etc. Executive Order 11000 provides for mobilization of all civilians into work brigades under the government supervision. Executive Order 11001 provides for governmental takeover of all health education and welfare functions. Executive Order 11002 designates the Postmaster General to operate a national registration of all persons. Executive Order 11003 provides for the government to take over airports and aircraft. Executive Order 11004 provides for the Housing and Finance Authority to relocate communities, designate areas to be abandoned, and establish new locations for populations. Executive Order 11005 provides for the government to take over railroads, inland waterways, and public storage facilities. Now, all of these were combined under Nixon into one huge executive order which allows all of this to take place if the President declares a national emergency and it can be implemented by the head of FEMA not by the President. The President has already given him that power under these executive orders. All of these were combined into Executive Order 11490, and that was signed by President Carter on July 20, 1979, and is, in fact, law. Now, remember what North said during the Iran-Contra hearing. He said that they were prepared to suspend the Constitution of the United States, and he said if it hadn't been for their getting caught that this would have happened. And all that did was delay it. This is what is still going to happen. President Bush issued a new executive order delegating to the director of FEMA powers which were vested in the President by the Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act of 1988. And although the order was described by the White House as simply a technical matter, in reality the revision delegated to the FEMA director direct responsibility for a large number of items which were earlier only the President's prerogative, and that includes responsibility for general federal assistance, federal emergency assistance, hazard mitigation, individual and family grant programs, and the power to direct other federal agencies to assist in an emergency. And that's the key. All other federal agencies will come under FEMA. Of course, the President retains the power to actually declare an emergency, but as soon as he does that, the implementation of the measures utilized will be transferred directly to the Director of FEMA. Professor Samuel P. Huntington drafted for Jimmy Carter Presidential Memorandum 
1932, which led to the creation of FEMA in 1979. He wrote the Seminal Peace for the Trilateral Commission in the mid-1970s, recommending that democracy and economic development be discarded as outdated ideas. He wrote as co-author of the book Crises in Democracy. We have come to recognize that there are potential desirable limits to economic growth. There are also potentially desirable limits to the indefinite extension of political democracy. A government which lacks authority will have little ability short of cataclysmic crises to impose on its people the sacrifices which may be necessary. All of Huntington's ideas were rewritten into National Security Decision Directive 47, and that was enacted by President Reagan on July 22, 1982. It identified important areas to be upgraded, such as the nation's industrial base to maintain the national defense, but it nonetheless, and this is very important, laid the groundwork for the secret government's options to institute a police state, and its title is Emergency Mobilization Preparedness. It ordered preparedness measures that involved the waiving or modification of socioeconomic regulations that delay emergency responses and that should receive priority attention. It also specified that preparedness measures that are or may be impeded by legal constraints be identified in the priority task that lays the groundwork for the suspension of the Constitution. This has nothing to do with the right wing, left wing, or any other damn thing. It has to do with the Illuminati taking over this country and joining in the new world order. I give lectures all over the United States. At some point, before, during, or after every lecture, some well-meaning but misguided soul tells me that I have it all wrong, and that it's the Jews, the Catholics, the Communists, or the bankers that are the cause of all our ills. The target group is blamed for everything that has ever gone wrong. Power over everyone and everything is always attributed to this group, whichever group it happens to be at that moment to that person. These poor people are on the right track in that there has been and certainly is a conspiracy to bring about a totalitarian world order. They are completely off track to think that any one ethnic, religious, or financial group alone could ever muster enough power to bring its plan to fruition. One group, you see, would always be opposed by all of the other special interest groups that exist and have always existed throughout history. That is, unless they were all really the same group, the Illuminati, or for some reason they became unified, the Bilderberg Group. The one group scenario, except for the Illuminati, has been used effectively to divert your attention away from the truth. It has caused you to fight each other in a manipulation that always leads the real conspiracy closer to its ultimate goal, a new world order. Following World War II, something happened that was to have tremendous significance for the future of all mankind. The intellectuals took note of this happening and brought it to the attention of the world power elite. The elite were severely shaken by the predicted repercussions of this event. They were told that by or shortly after the year 2000, the total collapse of civilization as we know it and the possible extinction of the human race could occur. It could occur, that is, if we did not destroy the earth with nuclear weapons before then. They were told that the only things that could stop these predicted events would be severe cutbacks of the human population, the cessation or retardation of technological and economic growth, the elimination of meat in the human diet, strict control of future human reproduction, a total commitment to preserving the environment, colonization of space, 
and a paradigm shift in the evolutionary consciousness of man. Those in power immediately formed an alliance and set about bringing the recommended changes to fruition through propaganda, mind control, and other manipulations of the masses. The Illuminati's prayers had been answered. What was this event that caused so much consternation and changed forever the future of the world? Millions of soldiers returned from war. The soldiers found lonely, eager women waiting for them. The greatest coupling in the history of the human race occurred. The result was everyone born between 1941 and 1955 and the children that they would eventually produce. It was me, and you, and everyone who lives today. It was the great worldwide baby boom. It was the culmination of all men's efforts to survive through history. It was modern medicine, better diets, heat in winter, pure running water, and proper disposal of sewage. It was the point in history when the birth rate so exceeded the death rate that the world's population doubled between 1957 and 1990. It was the most wonderful time in the history of the world but it was also the worst. It signaled the end of man's most precious achievement. An alliance of all of the powers on earth, open and hidden, decided that individual freedoms could no longer be tolerated in the interest of the preservation of the human race. They believed the common man could not be trusted. What had been the unfulfilled dream of many individual groups became reality by the concentration of power in the alliance known as the Bilderberg Group. What had been impossible before was now promised. The new world order that so many had envisioned was now a certainty. The first study was made during World War II to determine the impact of the returning soldiers upon the economy. The results mobilized the ruling elite. A second secret study was conducted in 1957 by scientists meeting in Huntsville, Alabama. It confirmed the results of the first. The conclusion was that civilization as we know it would collapse shortly after the year 2000 unless the population was seriously curtailed. Studies were done to determine a method to arrest the population explosion before the point of no return would be reached. It was determined that an immediate attack on the problem would involve two points of intervention. The first was to lower the birth rate, and the second was to increase the death rate. To lower the birth rate, several programs were put into motion. The first was the development of positive birth control methods using diaphragms and condoms, foam and birth control pills, and sterilization, abortion, and hysterectomy procedures. These were developed and implemented. The women's liberation movement was started with the demand for free abortions using pro-choice as its rallying cry. Homosexuality was encouraged, and gay liberation was born. Homosexuals do not have children. Zero population growth became a hot subject at cocktail parties. Individual freedom, the heat of the moment, religion, and the old blue laws sabotaged these efforts, and while zero population growth became a reality in some areas, population increased rapidly in others. The only alternative left to the world's ruling elite was to increase the death rate. This was a difficult thing to do, as no one wanted to pick people out of a crowd and line them up for execution. Neither did they relish the possible consequences of an enraged public upon discovering that they were being systematically murdered. Of course, a very short but very deadly global war using nuclear weapons upon select population concentrations was contemplated, and to tell you the truth, was not ruled out. The fact that such a population control was even contemplated confirmed the worst fears of those who had participated in the 1957 study. War 
was put on the back burner to simmer, but may become a reality. In the meantime, something else had to be done that would absolve the decision-makers of guilt and place the blame on those who did not lead clean lives. Something that could be blamed upon Mother Nature. What was needed was the bubonic plague or some other horrible but natural disease. The answer came from Rome. Several top-secret recommendations were made by Dr. Aurelio Pacei of the Club of Rome. He advocated that a plague be introduced that would have the same effect as the famous Black Death of history. The chief recommendation was to develop a microbe which would attack the autoimmune system and thus render the development of a vaccine impossible. The orders were given to develop the microbe and to develop a prophylactic and a cure. The microbe would be used against the general population and would be introduced by vaccine. The prophylactic was to be used by the ruling elite. The cure will be administered to the survivors when it is decided that enough people have died. The cure will be announced as newly developed when in fact it has existed from the beginning. This plan is a part of Global 2000. Funding was obtained from the United States Congress under House Bill 15090, passed in 1969, where $10 million was given to the Department of Defense's 1970 budget. Testimony before the Senate Committee revealed that they intended to produce a synthetic biological agent, an agent that does not naturally exist and for which no natural immunity could have been acquired. Within the next five to ten years, it would probably be possible to make a new infective microorganism which could differ in certain important aspects from any known disease-causing organisms. Most important of these is that it might be refractory to the immunological and therapeutic processes upon which we depend to maintain our relative freedom from infectious disease. Sir Julian Huxley said, Overpopulation is, in my opinion, the most serious threat to the whole future of our species. The project, called M.K. Naomi, was carried out at Fort Detrick, Maryland. Since large populations were to be decimated, the ruling elite decided to target the undesirable elements of society. Specifically targeted were the black, Hispanic, and homosexual populations. The poor homosexuals were encouraged on the one hand and scheduled for extinction on the other. The African continent was infected via smallpox vaccine in 1977. The vaccine was administered by the World Health Organization. According to Dr. Robert Strecker, without a cure, the entire black population of Africa will be dead within 15 years. Some countries are well beyond epidemic status. The United States population was infected in 1978 with the hepatitis B vaccine. Dr. Wolf Zmunis, the ex-roommate of Pope John Paul II, was the mastermind behind the November 78 to October 79 and March 80 to October 81 experimental hepatitis B vaccine trials conducted by the Centers for Disease Control in New York, San Francisco, and four other American cities. He loosed the plague of AIDS upon the American people. The gay population was infected. The ads for participants specifically ask for promiscuous homosexual male volunteers. Whatever causes AIDS was in the vaccine. The vaccine was manufactured and bottled in Phoenix, Arizona. Many other population controls have been promulgated. The reduction of the world's population to workable levels has been virtually assured. It is only a matter of time. The problem will be to curtail further human reproduction beyond approved levels. To handle that problem, the New World Order will adopt a communist Chinese model of population control. 
It is the only population control program that has ever worked. The old and infirm have been periodically murdered, and couples are forbidden to have more than one child. Penalties are so severe that families in China with two children are extremely rare. Three children families are non-existent. A surprising byproduct is that Chinese children as a group are treated better than any other national grouping of children in the world, including the United States. Tobacco fields in the United States have been fertilized with the radioactive tailings from uranium mines, resulting in a tremendous increase in the incidence of lip, mouth, throat, and lung cancer. If you do not believe it, just look at the incidence of lung cancer per capita before 1950 and compare it to the lung cancer per capita at the present time. Are those who smoke committing suicide, or are they being murdered? We have watched the news in horror as story after story unfolded, revealing that the Army and the Central Intelligence Agency had released germs and viruses into the population to test their biological warfare capability. In light of what you have now learned, you should know that it was really to reduce population. It is a matter of public record that investigations into cover-ups of radioactive leaks into the atmosphere and into groundwater have revealed that some leaks were not accidental, but were purposeful. Some areas of the country now have such a high rate of cancer that virtually everyone who lives in these areas will die other than a natural death. The true extent of radioactive gases, waste, and toxic material especially cesium-137, strontium-90, uranium mine and mill tailings, thorium-230, radium-226, and radon-222 that has leaked or has been purposefully planted in the atmosphere, soil, and groundwater is far beyond anything you or I can imagine. Every investigation has revealed that the true figures regarding radioactive leakage are much larger than official figures, and the real numbers may never be known. Cover-up has become standard operating procedure at all levels and in all departments of government. Do we dream reality, or is reality a dream? The New World Order will eliminate the population threat in several ways. Complete control of individual behavior may be established using electronic or chemical implants. No one will be allowed to have a child without permission. Stiff penalties wait for those who ignore the law. The violent, the old, the infirm, the handicapped, and the unproductive will be killed. Private property will be abolished. Since religion helped to create the population problem, it will not be tolerated except for the approved state-controlled religion which will evolve according to man's needs. Man cannot be trusted to safeguard what little is left in the way of natural resources. Technological development and economic growth will be severely cut back. Man will be required to live like his ancestors. Those who learn to be self-sufficient and can adapt to the absence of many of the things that we take for granted today, such as automobiles, will get along fine. Others will suffer terribly. Man will once again conform to the law of the survival of the fittest. No one is going to like the loss of individual freedoms guaranteed us by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. I do not like or agree with what is planned. Intellectually, I know that people will not solve the problems that we face unless they are made to do it. That is a sad commentary on the common man, but nevertheless it is true. The New World Order is evil, but very much needed if man is to survive long enough to plant his seed amongst the stars. A paradigm shift and star seed are the only legitimate long-term answers. This is why we have all been so wrong for so long. It never was what we thought it was. Nothing is or ever will be until we learn to live in reality instead of fantasy land. A paradigm shift in the evolutionary consciousness of man must take place. Right or wrong, the world is covered with agents of the Illuminati who are attempting to cause that evolutionary jump. 
we have not been taken into their confidence. It is true that without the population or the bomb problem, the elect would use some other excuse to bring about the New World Order. They have plans to bring about things like earthquakes, war, the Messiah, an extraterrestrial landing, and economic collapse. They might bring about all of these things just to make damn sure that it does work. They will do whatever is necessary to succeed. The Illuminati has all the bases covered, and you are going to have to be on your toes to make it through the coming years. We must learn to accept individual responsibility for the world's problems or be willing to live by the terms of those who do. We must learn to love one another, share, deplore violence, and work with nature, not against it. We must do all of this while colonizing the universe. We must be prepared in the process to peacefully meet and deal with an extraterrestrial intelligence. I believe they exist. Can you imagine what will happen if Los Angeles is hit with a 9.0 quake? New York City is destroyed by a terrorist-planted atomic bomb. World War III breaks out in the Middle East. The banks and the stock markets collapse. Extraterrestrials land on the White House lawn. Food disappears from the markets. Some people disappear. The Messiah presents himself to the world, and all in a very short period of time. Can you imagine? The world power structure can and will, if necessary, make some or all of those things happen to bring about the new world order. Patriots must not be at home on any national holiday during the day or night ever again until the danger is past. Disregard this warning, and you will find yourself in a concentration camp. In the camp, you will be treated for a mental illness called nationalism, common to patriots. This illness is not in the interest of the new world order. Those who cannot be cured will be exterminated. When asked what was in store for the world in the coming years, Henry Kissinger said this, Everything is going to be different. Many will suffer. A new world order will emerge. It will be a much better world for those who survive. In the long run, life will be better. The world we have wanted will be reality. Most of this knowledge comes directly from or is a result of my own research into the top secret magic spelled M-A-J-I-C material which I saw and read between the years 1970 and 1973 as a member of the intelligence briefing team of the commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet. Since some of this information was derived from sources that I cannot divulge for obvious reasons, and from published sources, which I cannot vouch for, this must be termed a hypothesis. I firmly believe that if aliens are real, this is the true nature of the beast. It is the only scenario that has been able to bind all the diverse elements. It is the only scenario that answers all the questions and places the various fundamental mysteries in an arena that makes sense. It is the only explanation which shows the chronology of events and demonstrates that the chronologies, when assembled, match perfectly. The bulk of this I believe to be true if the material that I viewed in the Navy is authentic. During the years following World War II, the government of the United States was confronted with a series of events which were to change beyond prediction its future and with it the future of humanity. These events were so incredible that they defied belief. A stunned President Truman and his top military commanders found themselves virtually impotent after having just won the most devastating and costly war in history. The United States had developed, used, and was the only nation on earth in possession of the atomic bomb. This new weapon had the potential to destroy any enemy, and even the Earth itself. At that time, the United States had the best economy, the most advanced technology, the highest standard of living, exerted the most influence, and fielded the largest, 
and most powerful military forces in history. We can only imagine the confusion and concern when the informed elite of the United States government discovered that an alien spacecraft piloted by insect-like beings from a totally incomprehensible culture had crashed in the desert of New Mexico. Between January 1947 and December 1952, at least 16 crashed or downed alien craft, 65 alien bodies, and one live alien were recovered. An additional alien craft had exploded, and nothing was recovered from that incident. Of these events, 13 occurred within the borders of the United States, not including the craft which disintegrated in the air. Of these 13, one was in Arizona, 11 were in New Mexico, and one was in Nevada. Three occurred in foreign countries. Of those, one was in Norway, and the last two were in Mexico. Sightings of UFOs were so numerous that serious investigation and debunking of each report became impossible, utilizing the existing intelligence assets. An alien craft was found on February the 13th, 1948, on a mesa near Aztec, New Mexico. Another craft was located on March 25, 1948, in White Sands Proving Ground. It was 100 feet in diameter. A total of 17 alien bodies were recovered from those two craft. Of even greater significance was the discovery of a large number of human body parts stored within both of these vehicles. A demon had reared its head, and paranoia quickly took hold of everyone then in the know. The secret lid immediately became a top-secret lid and was screwed down tight. The security blanket was even tighter than that imposed upon the Manhattan Project. In the coming years, these events were to become the most closely guarded secrets in the history of the world. A special group of America's top scientists were organized under the name Project Sign in December 1947 to study the phenomenon. The whole nasty business was contained. Project Sign evolved into Project Grudge in December 1948. A low-level collection and disinformation project named Blue Book was formed under Grudge. Sixteen volumes were to come out of Grudge. Blue teams were put together to recover the crashed discs and dead or live aliens. The blue teams were later to evolve into alpha teams under Project Pounce. During these early years, the United States Air Force and the Central Intelligence Agency exercised complete control over the alien secret. In fact, the CIA was formed by Presidential Executive Order first as the Central Intelligence Group for the express purpose of dealing with the alien presence. Later, the National Security Act was passed, establishing it as the Central Intelligence Agency. The National Security Council was established to oversee the intelligence community and especially the alien endeavor. A series of National Security Council memos and executive orders removed the CIA from the sole task of gathering foreign intelligence and slowly but thoroughly legalized direct action in the form of covert activities at home and abroad. On December 9, 1947, Truman approved issuance of NSC-4, entitled Coordination of Foreign Intelligence Information Measures, at the urging of Secretaries Marshall, Forrestal, Patterson, and the Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff, George Kennan. The Foreign and Military Intelligence Book 1, Final Report of the Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with Respect to Intelligence Activities, United States Senate, 94th Congress, Second Session, Report Number 94-755, April 26, 1976, page 49, states. This directive empowered the Secretary of State to coordinate overseas information activities designed to counter communism. A top-secret annex to NSC-4 
NSC-4 Alpha, instructed the Director of Central Intelligence to undertake covert psychological activities in pursuit of the aims set forth in NSC-4. The initial authority given the CIA for covert operations under NSC-4 Alpha did not establish formal procedures for either coordinating or approving these operations. It simply directed the DCI to undertake covert actions and to ensure, through liaison with state and defense, that the resulting operations were consistent with American policy. Later, NSC-10-1 and NSC-10-2 were to supersede NSC-4 and NSC-4-alpha and expanded the covert abilities even further. These actions established a buffer between the President and the information. It was intended that this buffer serve as a means for the President to deny knowledge if leaks divulged the true state of affairs. This buffer was used in later years for the purpose of effectively isolating succeeding Presidents from any knowledge of the alien presence other than what the secret government and the intelligence community wanted them to know. Secretary of Defense James Forrestal objected to the secrecy. He was a very idealistic and religious man. He believed that the public should be told. James Forrestal was also one of the first known abductees. When he began to talk to leaders of the opposition party and leaders of the Congress about the alien problem, he was asked to resign by Truman. He expressed his fears to many people, rightfully, he believed that he was being watched. This was interpreted by those who were ignorant of the facts as paranoia. Forrestal later was said to have suffered a mental breakdown. He was ordered to the mental ward of Bethesda Naval Hospital, in spite of the fact that the administration had no authority to have him committed, the order was carried out. In fact, it was feared that Forrestal would begin to talk again. He had to be isolated and discredited. His family and friends were denied permission to visit. Finally, on May 21, 1949, Forrestal's brother made a fateful decision. He notified authorities that he intended to remove James from Bethesda on May 22. Sometime in the early morning of May 22, 1949, agents of the Central Intelligence Agency tied a sheet around James Forrestal's neck fastened the other end to a fixture in his room, then threw James Forrestal out the window. The sheet tore, and he plummeted to his death. James Forrestal's secret diaries were confiscated by the CIA and were kept in the White House for many years. Due to public demand, the diaries were eventually rewritten and published in a sanitized version. The real diary information was later furnished by the CIA in book form to an agent who published the material as fiction. The name of the agent is Whitley Strieber, and the book is Majestic. James Forrestal became one of the first victims of the cover-up. The live alien that had been found wandering in the desert from the 1949 Roswell crash was named E.B., the name had been suggested by Dr. Vannevar Bush and was short for Extraterrestrial Biological Entity. E.B. had a tendency to lie and for over a year would give only the desired answer to questions asked. Those questions, which would have resulted in an undesirable answer, went unanswered. At some point during the second year of captivity, he began to open up. The information derived from E.B. was startling, to say the least. This compilation of his revelations became the foundation of what would later be called the Yellow Book. Photographs were taken of E.B., which, among others, I was to view years later in Project Grudge. In late 1951, E.B. became ill. Medical personnel had been unable to determine the cause of E.B.'s illness, and had no background from which to draw. E.B.'s system was chlorophyll-based, and he processed food into energy much the same as plants. Waste material was excreted the same as plants. Several experts were called in to study the illness. These specialists included medical doctors, botanists, 
and entomologists. A botanist, Dr. Guillermo Mendoza, was brought in to try and help him recover. Dr. Mendoza worked to save E.B. until June the 2nd, 1952, when E.B. died. Dr. Mendoza became the expert on at least this type of alien biology. The movie E.T. is the thinly disguised story of E.B. In a futile attempt to save E.B. and to gain favor with this technologically superior race, the United States began broadcasting a call for help early in 1952 into the vast regions of space. The call went unanswered, but the project, dubbed Sigma, continued as an effort of good faith. President Truman created the super-secret National Security Agency known as the NSA by secret executive order on November the 4th, 1952. Its primary purpose was to decipher the alien communications, language, and establish a dialogue with the extraterrestrials. This most urgent task was a continuation of the earlier effort. The secondary purpose of the NSA was to monitor all communications and emissions from any and all electronic devices worldwide for the purpose of gathering intelligence, both human and alien, and to contain the secret of the alien presence. Project Sigma was successful. The NSA also maintains communications with the Luna Base and other secret space programs. By executive order of the President, the NSA is exempt from all laws which do not specifically name the NSA in the text of the law as being subject to that law. That means that if the agency is not spelled out in the text of any and every law passed by the Congress, it is not subject to that or those laws. The NSA now performs many other duties, and in fact is the premier agency within the intelligence network. Today, the NSA receives approximately 75% of the monies allotted to the intelligence community. The old saying, where the money goes, therein the power resides, is true. The director of Central Intelligence today is a figurehead maintained as a public ruse. The primary task of the NSA is still alien communications, but now includes other extraterrestrial projects as well. President Truman had been keeping our allies, including the Soviet Union, informed of the developing alien problem. This had been done in case the aliens turned out to be a threat to the human race. Plans were formulated to defend the Earth in case of invasion. Great difficulty was encountered in maintaining international secrecy. It was decided that an outside group was necessary to coordinate and control international efforts in order to hide the secret from the normal scrutiny of governments by the press. The result was the formation of a secret ruling body which became known as the Bilderberg Group. The group was formed and met for the first time in 1952. They were named after the first publicly known meeting place, the Bilderberg Hotel. That public meeting took place in 1954. They were nicknamed the Bilderbergers. The headquarters of this group is in The Hague. The Bilderbergers evolved into a secret world government that now controls everything. The United Nations was then, and is now, an international joke. Beginning in 1953, a new president occupied the White House. He was a man used to a structured staff organization with a chain of command. His method was to delegate authority and rule by committee. He made major decisions but only when his advisors were unable to come to a consensus. His normal method was to read through or listen to several alternatives and then approve one. Those who worked closely with him have stated that his favorite comment was, Just do whatever it takes. He spent a lot of time on the golf course. This was not unusual for a man who had been career army with the ultimate position of supreme allied commander during a war, a post which had earned him five stars. 
The president was General of the Army Dwight David Eisenhower. During his first year in office, 1953, at least 10 more crashed disks were recovered along with 26 dead and four live aliens. Of the 10, four were found in Arizona, two in Texas, one in New Mexico, one in Louisiana, one in Montana, and one in South Africa. There were hundreds of sightings. Eisenhower knew that he had to wrestle and beat the alien problem. He knew that he could not do it by revealing the secret to the Congress. Early in 1953, the new president turned to his friend and fellow member of the Council on Foreign Relations, Nelson Rockefeller. Eisenhower and Rockefeller began planning the secret structure of alien task supervision, which was to become a reality within one year. The idea for MJ-12 was thus born. It was Nelson's uncle, Winthrop Aldrich, who had been crucial in convincing Eisenhower to run for president. The whole Rockefeller family, and with them, the Rockefeller empire had solidly backed Ike. Eisenhower belonged heart and soul to the Council on Foreign Relations and the Rockefeller family. Asking Rockefeller for help with the alien problem was to be the biggest mistake Eisenhower ever made for the future of the United States and maybe for humanity. Within one week of Eisenhower's election, he had appointed Nelson Rockefeller chairman of a presidential advisory committee on government organization. Rockefeller was responsible for planning the reorganization of the government, something he had dreamed of for many years. New Deal programs went into one single cabinet position called the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. When the Congress approved the new cabinet position in April 1953, Nelson was named to the post of undersecretary to Ovida Culp Hobby. In 1953, astronomers discovered large objects in space which were tracked moving toward the Earth. It was first believed that they were asteroids. Later evidence proved that the objects could only be spaceships. Project Sigma intercepted alien radio communications. When the objects reached the Earth, they took up a very high geosynchronous orbit around the equator. There were several huge ships, and their actual intent was unknown. Project Sigma and a new project, Plato, through radio communications using the computer binary language, were able to arrange a landing that resulted in face-to-face -face contact with alien beings from another planet. This landing took place in the desert. The movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind is a fictionalized version of the actual events. Project Plato was tasked with establishing diplomatic relations with this race of space aliens. A hostage was left with us as a pledge that they would return and formalize a treaty. In the meantime, a race of humanoid aliens landed at Homestead Air Force Base in Florida and successfully communicated with the United States government. This group warned us against the race orbiting the equator and offered to help us with our spiritual development. They demanded that we dismantle and destroy our nuclear weapons as the major condition. They refused to exchange technology, citing that we were spiritually unable to handle the technology we already possessed. These overtures were rejected on the grounds that it would be foolish to disarm in the face of such an uncertain future. There was no track record to read from. It may have been an unfortunate decision. A third landing at Muroc, now Edwards Air Force Base, took place in 1954. The base was closed for three days, and no one was allowed to enter or leave during that time. The historical event had been planned in advance. Details of a treaty had been agreed upon. Eisenhower arranged to be in Palm Springs on vacation. On the appointed day, the president was spirited to the base. The excuse was given to the press that he was visiting a dentist. Witnesses to the event have stated that three UFOs flew over the base and then landed. 
Anti-aircraft batteries were undergoing live fire training, and the startled personnel actually fired at the crafts as they passed overhead. Luckily, the shells missed, and no one was injured. President Eisenhower met with the aliens on February the 20th, 1954, and a formal treaty between the alien nation and the United States of America was signed. We then received our first alien ambassador from outer space. He was the hostage that had been left at the first landing in the desert. His name and title was His Omnipotent Highness Krill. In the American tradition of disdain for royal titles, he was secretly called Original Hostage Krill. Shortly after this meeting, President Eisenhower suffered a heart attack. Four others present at the meeting were Franklin Allen of the Hearst Newspapers, Edwin Norse of Brookings Institute, Gerald Light of Metaphysical Research fame, and Catholic Bishop McIntyre of Los Angeles. Their reaction was judged as the microcosm of what the public reaction might be. Based upon this reaction, it was decided that the public could not be told. Later studies confirmed the decision as sound. An emotionally revealing letter written by Gerald Light spells it out in chilling detail. It reads, My dear friend, I have just returned from Muroc. The report is true, devastatingly true. I made the journey in company with Franklin Allen of the Hearst Papers and Edwin Norse of Brookings Institute, who was Truman's erstwhile financial advisor, and Bishop McIntyre of Los Angeles. Keep these names confidential for the present, please. When we were allowed to enter the restricted section, after about six hours in which we were checked out on every possible item, event, incident, and aspect of our personal and public lives, I had the distinct feeling that the world had come to an end with fantastic realism. For I have never seen so many human beings in a state of complete collapse and confusion as they realized that their own world had indeed ended with such finality as to beggar description. The reality of other plain arrow forms is now and forever removed from the realms of speculation and made a rather painful part of the consciousness of every responsible scientific and political group. During my two days visit, I saw five separate and distinct types of aircraft being studied and handled by our Air Force officials, with the assistance and permission of the Ethereans. I have no words to express my reaction. It has finally happened. It is now a matter of history. President Eisenhower, as you may already know, was spirited over to Muroc one night during his visit to Palm Springs recently, and it is my conviction that he will ignore the terrific conflict between the various authorities and go directly to the people via radio and television, if the impasse continues much longer. From what I could gather, an official statement to the country is being prepared for delivery about the middle of May. We know that no such announcement was ever made. The Silence Control Group won the day. We also know that two more ships, for which we can find no witnesses, either landed sometime after the three or were already at the base before the three landed. Gerald Light specifically states that five ships were present and were undergoing study by the Air Force. His metaphysical experience is evident in that he calls the entities Ethereans. Gerald Light capitalized Ethereum, calling attention to the fact that these beings might have been viewed as gods by Mr. Light. The alien emblem was known as the Trilateral Insignia and was displayed on the craft and worn on the alien uniforms. Both of these landings and the second meeting were filmed. These films exist today. The treaty stated that the aliens would not interfere in our affairs and we would not interfere in theirs. We would keep their presence on Earth a secret. They would furnish us with advanced technology and would help us in our technological development. 
they would not make any treaty with any other earth nation. They could abduct humans on a limited and periodic basis for the purpose of medical examination and monitoring of our development, with the stipulation that the humans would not be harmed, would be returned to their point of abduction, would have no memory of the event, and that the alien nation would furnish Majesty Twelve with a list of all human contacts and abductees on a regularly scheduled basis. It was agreed that each nation would receive the ambassador of the other for as long as the treaty remained in force. It was further agreed that the alien nation and the United States would exchange 16 personnel with the purpose of learning of each other. The alien guests would remain on Earth. The human guests would travel to the alien point of origin for a specified period of time, then return, at which point a reverse exchange would be made. A reenactment of this event was dramatized in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. A tip-off to who works for whom can be determined by the fact that Dr. J. Allen Hynek served as the technical advisor for the film. I noticed that the top-secret report containing the official version of the truth of the alien question, entitled Project Grudge, which I read while in the Navy, was co-authored by Lieutenant Colonel Friend and Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was cited as a Central Intelligence Agency asset attached to Project Grudge. Dr. Hynek, the one who debunked many legitimate UFO incidents when he functioned as the scientific member of the very public Project Blue Book. Dr. Hynek is the man responsible for the infamous It Was Only Swamp Gas statement. It was agreed that bases would be constructed underground for the use of the alien nation and that two bases would be constructed for the joint use of the alien nation and the United States government. Exchange of technology would take place in the jointly occupied bases. These alien bases would be constructed under Indian reservations in the Four Corners area of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, and one would be constructed in an area known as Dreamland. Dreamland was built in the Mojave Desert near or in a place called Yucca. I cannot remember if it was Yucca Valley, Yucca Flat, or Yucca Proving Ground, but Yucca Valley is what I always seem to want to say. More UFO sightings and incidents occur in the Mojave Desert of California than any other place in the world. So many, in fact, that no one even bothers to make reports. Anyone who ventures into the desert to talk to the residents will be astounded by the frequency of activity and with the degree of acceptance demonstrated by those who have come to regard UFOs as normal. According to the documents that I read, all alien areas are under complete control of the Naval Department. All personnel who work in these complexes receive their checks from the Navy through a subcontractor. The checks never make reference to the government or the Navy. Construction of the bases began immediately, but progress was slow. Large amounts of money were made available in 1957. Work continued on the Yellow Book. Project Red Light was formed, and experimentation in test-flying alien craft was begun in earnest. A super top-secret facility was built at Groom Lake in Nevada in the midst of the weapons test range. It was codenamed Area 51. The installation was placed under the Department of the Navy, and all personnel required a Q clearance as well as executive approval. This is ironic due to the fact that the President of the United States does not have clearance to visit this site. The alien base and exchange of technology actually took place in an area codenamed Dreamland above ground, and the underground portion was dubbed the Dark Side of the Moon. According to the documentation that I read, at least 600 alien beings actually resided full-time at this site along with an unknown number of scientists and CIA personnel. Due to the fear of implantation, 
Only certain people were allowed to interface with the alien beings, and those personnel were and are watched and monitored continuously. The Army was tasked to form a super-secret organization to furnish security for the alien task projects. This organization became the National Reconnaissance Organization based at Fort Carson, Colorado. The specific teams trained to secure the projects were called Delta. Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz was a Delta Force commander. A second project, codenamed Snowbird, was promulgated to explain away any sightings of the red light crafts as being Air Force experiments. The Snowbird crafts were manufactured using conventional technology and were flown for the press on several occasions. Project Snowbird was also used to debunk legitimate public sightings of alien craft. Project Snowbird was very successful and reports from the public declined steadily until recent years. A multi-million dollar secret fund was organized and kept by the military office of the White House. This fund was used to build over 75 deep underground facilities. Presidents who asked were told the fund was used to build deep underground shelters for the president in case of war. Only a few were built for the president. Millions of dollars were used to build top-secret alien bases as well as top-secret dumb, deep underground military bases. President Johnson used this fund to build a movie theater and pave the road on his ranch. He had no idea of its true purpose. The secret White House Underground Construction Fund was set up in 1957 by President Eisenhower. The funding was obtained from Congress under the guise of construction and maintenance of secret sites where the president could be taken in case of military attack, presidential emergency sites. The sites are literally holes in the ground deep enough to withstand a nuclear blast and are outfitted with state-of-the-art communications equipment. To date, there are more than 75 sites spread around the country which were built using the money from this fund. The Atomic Energy Commission has built at least an additional 22 underground sites. The location and everything to do with these sites were and are considered and treated as top secret. The money was and is in control of the military office of the White House and was and is laundered through so circuitous a web that even the most knowledgeable spy or accountant cannot follow it. By secret executive memorandum NSC 5510, Eisenhower had preceded NSC 5412-1 to establish a permanent committee to be known as Majesty 12 to oversee and conduct all covert activities concerned with the alien question. There were 19 members of Majesty 12. The first rule of Majesty 12 was that no order could be given and no action could be taken without a majority vote of 12 in favor, thus Majority 12. Orders issued by Majesty 12 became known as Majority 12 Directives. This group was made up over the years of the top officers and directors of the Council on Foreign Relations and later the Trilateral Commission. Gordon Dean, George Bush, and Zbigniew Brzezinski were among them. By 1955, it became obvious that the aliens had deceived Eisenhower and had broken the treaty. Mutilated humans were being found, along with mutilated animals across the United States. It was suspected that the aliens were not submitting a complete list of human contacts and abductees to Majesty 12, and it was suspected that not all abductees had been returned. The Soviet Union was suspected of interfacing with them, and this proved to be true. The aliens stated that they had been and were then manipulating masses of people through secret societies, witchcraft, magic, the occult, and religion. You must understand that this claim could also be a manipulation. After several Air Force combat air engagements with alien craft, 
it also became apparent that our weapons were no match against them. In November 1955, NSC 5412-2 was issued, establishing a study committee to explore all factors which are involved in the making and implementing of foreign policy in the nuclear age. This was only a blanket of snow that covered the real subject of study, the alien question. By secret executive memorandum, NSC 5511 in 1954, President Eisenhower had commissioned the study group to examine all the facts, evidence, lies, and deception, and discover the truth of the alien question. A major finding of the alien study was that the public could not be told. It was believed that this would most certainly lead to economic collapse, collapse of the religious structure, and national panic, which could lead into anarchy. Secrecy thus continued. An offshoot of this finding was that if the public could not be told, Congress could not be told. Funding for the projects and research would have to come from outside the government. In the meantime, money was to be obtained from the military budget and from Central Intelligence Agency confidential, non-appropriated funds. Another major finding was that the aliens were using humans and animals for a source of glandular secretions, enzymes, hormonal secretions, blood plasma, and possibly in genetic experiments. The aliens explained these actions as necessary to their survival. They stated that their genetic structure had deteriorated and that they were no longer able to reproduce. They stated that if they were unable to improve their genetic structure, their race would soon cease to exist. We looked upon their explanations with extreme suspicion. Since our weapons were literally useless against the aliens, Majesty 12 decided to continue friendly diplomatic relations until such time as we were able to develop a technology which would enable us to challenge them on a military basis. Overtures would have to be made to the Soviet Union and other nations to join forces for the survival of humanity. A symposium was held in 1957, which was attended by some of the great scientific minds then living. They reached the conclusion that by or shortly after the year 2000, the planet would self-destruct due to increased population and man's exploitation of the environment without any help from God or the aliens. By secret executive order of President Eisenhower, the Jason scholars were ordered to study this scenario and make recommendations from their findings. The Jason Society confirmed the findings of the scientists and made three recommendations called Alternatives 1, 2, and 3. Alternative 1 was to use nuclear devices to blast holes in the stratosphere from which the heat and pollution could escape into space. They would then change the human cultures from that of exploitation into cultures of environmental protection. Of the three, this was decided to be the least likely to succeed due to the inherent nature of man and the additional damage the nuclear explosions would themselves create. The existence of a hole in the ozone layer may indicate that Alternative 1 might have been attempted. This is, however, only conjecture. Alternative 2 was to build a vast network of underground cities and tunnels in which a select representation of all cultures and occupations could survive and carry on the human race. The rest of humanity would be left to fend for themselves on the surface of the planet. We know that these facilities have been built and are ready and waiting for the chosen few to be notified. Alternative three was to exploit the alien and conventional technology in order for a select few to leave the Earth and establish colonies in outer space. I am not able to either confirm or deny the existence of batch consignments of human slaves, which would be used for the manual labor as a part of the plan. The moon, codenamed Adam, was the object of primary interest, followed by the planet Mars, codenamed Eve. 
I am now in possession of official NASA photographs of one of the moon bases. I believe that the Mars colony is also a reality. As a delaying action, all three alternatives included birth control, sterilization, and the introduction of deadly microbes to control or slow the growth of the Earth's population. AIDS is only one result of these plans. It was decided by the elite that since the population must be reduced and controlled, it would be in the best interest of the human race to rid ourselves of the undesirable elements of our society. Specific targeted populations included blacks, Hispanics, and homosexuals. The joint United States and Soviet leadership dismissed Alternative 1, but ordered work to begin on Alternatives 2 and 3 virtually at the same time. In 1959, the RAND Corporation hosted a deep underground construction symposium. In the symposium report, machines are pictured and described which could bore a tunnel 45 feet in diameter at the rate of 5 feet per hour in 1959. It also displays pictures of huge tunnels and underground vaults containing what appeared to be complex facilities and possibly even cities. It appears that the previous five years of all-out underground construction had made significant progress by that time. The official space program was boosted by President Kennedy in his inaugural address when he mandated that the United States put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. Although innocent in its conception, this mandate enabled those in charge to funnel vast amounts of money into black projects and conceal the real space program from the American people. A similar program in the Soviet Union served the same purpose. In fact, a joint alien United States and Soviet Union base existed on the moon at the very moment Kennedy spoke the words. During the United States' initial space exploration and the moon landings, every launch was accompanied by alien craft. On November 20, 1990, Los Angeles TV Channel 2 announced that a separate red, glowing, round-shaped object accompanied the space shuttle Atlantis on its latest classified military mission. That was the first public admission. A moon base, Luna, was photographed by the Lunar Orbiter and filmed by the Apollo astronauts. Domes, spires, tall round structures which look like silos, huge T-shaped mining vehicles that left stitch-like tracks in the lunar surface, and extremely large as well as small alien craft appear in the official NASA photographs. It is a joint United States and Soviet base. The space program is a farce and an unbelievable waste of money. Alternative 3 is a reality. It is not science fiction. Since our interaction with the aliens began, we have come into possession of technology beyond our wildest dreams. We currently have, and fly, atomic-powered anti-gravity type craft in Nevada. Our pilots have made interplanetary voyages in these craft and have been to the moon, Mars, and other planets. We have been lied to about the true nature of the moon, the planets, Mars and Venus, and the real state of technology that we possess today at this very moment. There are areas on the moon where plant life grows and even changes color with the seasons. This seasonal effect is because the moon does not, as claimed, always present the exact same side to the earth or the sun. The moon has several man-made lakes and ponds upon its surface, and clouds have been observed and filmed in its atmosphere. It possesses a gravitational field, and man can walk upon its surface without a spacesuit, breathing from an oxygen bottle after undergoing decompression, the same as any deep-sea diver. I have the official NASA photographs. Some of them were published in the books, we Discovered Alien Bases on the Moon by Fred Steckling and Someone Else is on the Moon. In 1969, a confrontation broke out between the Soviets and Americans at the lunar base. The Soviets attempted to take control of the base and held American scientists and personnel hostage. 
we were able to restore order, but not before 66 people were killed. The Soviets were suspended from the program for a period of two years. A reconciliation eventually took place, and once again we began to interact. Another plan is in force. It is the plan to prepare the public for eventual confrontation with an alien race. It could also intend to make you believe in an alien race that may not exist. The public is being bombarded with movies, radio, advertising, and TV programs depicting almost every aspect of the purported true nature of an alien presence. This includes the good and the bad. Look around and pay attention. Someone is planning to make their presence known, and the government is preparing you for it. They do not want any panic. The unprecedented number of sightings worldwide indicates that public exposure is not far off. Never in history have there been so many incidents involving UFOs, and never in history have there been so many official acknowledgments. For many years, the secret government has been importing drugs and selling them to the people, mainly the poor and minorities. Social welfare programs were put into place to create a dependent, non-working element in our society. The government then began to remove these programs to force people into a criminal class that did not exist in the 50s and 60s. The government encouraged the manufacture and importation of military firearms for the criminals to use. This is intended to foster a feeling of insecurity, which would lead the American people to voluntarily disarm themselves by passing laws against firearms. Using drugs and hypnosis on mental patients in a process called Orion, the CIA inculcated the desire in these people to open fire on schoolyards, and thus inflame the anti-gun lobby. This plan is well underway, and so far is working perfectly. The middle class is begging the government to do away with the Second Amendment. The media will convince the American people that a state of anarchy exists within the major cities. When public opinion has been won to this idea, they intend to state that a terrorist group armed with a nuclear weapon has entered the United States and that they plan to detonate this device in one of our cities. The government will then suspend the Constitution and declare martial law. The secret alien army of implanted humans and all dissidents, which translates into anyone they choose, will be rounded up and placed in the one-mile-square concentration camps which already exist. Are the people whom they intend to place in these concentration camps destined to make up the reported batch consignments of slave labor needed by the space colonies? The media, radio, TV, newspapers, and computer networks will be nationalized and seized. Anyone who resists will be taken or killed. This entire operation was rehearsed by the government and military in 1984 under the code name Rex 84 Alpha, and it went off without a hitch. When these events have transpired, the secret government and our alien takeover will be complete. Your freedom will never be returned, and you will live in slavery for the remainder of your life. You had better wake up, and you had better do it now. The conclusions are inescapable. 1. The secret power structure may believe that by our own ignorance or by divine decree, planet Earth will self-destruct sometime in the near future. These men sincerely believe that they are doing the right thing in their attempt to save the human race. It is terribly ironic that they have been forced to take as their partner an alien race which is itself engaged in a monumental struggle for survival. Many moral and legal compromises may have been made in this joint effort. These compromises were made in error and must be corrected. Those responsible should be brought to account for their actions. I can understand the fear and urgency that must have been instrumental in the decision not to tell the public. 
Obviously, I disagree with that decision. Throughout history, small but powerful groups of men have consistently felt that they alone were capable of deciding the fates of millions. Throughout history, they have been wrong. This great nation owes its very existence to the principles of freedom and democracy. I believe with all my heart that the United States of America cannot and will not succeed in any effort that ignores those principles. Full disclosure to the public should be made, and we should proceed to save the human race together. 2. We are being manipulated by a joint human alien power structure which will result in a one-world government and the partial enslavement of the human race. This has been deemed necessary to solve the elemental question, who will speak for planet Earth? It has been decided that man is not mature enough in his evolutionary development to be trusted to interact properly with an alien race. We already have enough trouble between the different human races, so what would happen if a totally alien extraterrestrial race was introduced? Would they be lynched, spit upon, or shot? Would discrimination result in nasty encounters that would doom humanity as a result of the aliens' obviously superior technology? Have our leaders decided to lock us in the playpen? The only way to prevent this scenario from taking place is to cause an evolutionary leap in consciousness, a paradigm shift for the entire human race. I have no idea how it can be done but I know that it desperately needs to be done. It needs to be done very quickly and very quietly. Three, the government has been totally deceived and we are being manipulated by an alien power, which will result in the total enslavement and or destruction of the human race. We must use any and every means available to prevent this from happening. Four, if none of this is true, something else may be happening which is beyond our ability to understand at this moment. We must force disclosure of all of the facts, discover the truth, and act upon it. The situation in which we find ourselves is due to our own actions or inactions over the last 44 years. Because it is our own fault, we are the only ones who can change future events. Education seems to me to be a major part of the solution. The remaining part is the abolition of secrecy. And five, there is always the possibility that I was used, that the whole alien scenario is the greatest hoax in history designed to create an alien enemy from outer space in order to expedite the formation of a one-world government. I have found evidence that this could be true. Through ignorance or misplaced trust, we as a people have abdicated our role as the watchdog of our government. Our government was founded of the people, for the people, by the people. There was no mention or intent ever to abdicate our role and place our total trust in a handful of men who meet secretly to decide our fate. In fact, the structure of our government was designed to prevent that from ever happening. If we had done our jobs as citizens, we would never have reached this point. Most of us are completely ignorant as to even the most basic functions of our government. We have truly become a nation of sheep. And sheep are always eventually led to slaughter. It is time to stand up in the manner of our forefathers and walk like men. You must understand that real or not, the purported presence of aliens have been used to neutralize certain widely different segments of the population. Don't worry, the benevolent space brothers will save you. It can also be used to fill the need for an extraterrestrial threat to justify the formation of a new world order. 
The aliens are eating us. The most important information that you need to determine your future actions is that this new world order calls for the destruction of the sovereignty of nations, including the United States. The new world order cannot and will not allow our Constitution to continue to exist. The New World Order will be a totalitarian socialist system. We will be slaves shackled to a cashless system of economic control. If the documentation that I viewed while I was in naval intelligence is true, then what you have just heard is probably closer to the truth than anything ever spoken. If extraterrestrials are a hoax, then what you just heard is exactly what the Illuminati wants you to believe. I can assure you, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that even if aliens are not real, the technology is real. Anti-gravity craft exist, and human pilots fly them. I and millions of others have seen them. They are metal, they are machines. They come in different sizes and shapes. They are obviously intelligently guided. Now, here is an interview with author William Cooper. So, Mr. Cooper, are there uh, larger numbers of people all the time who are receptive to your message and who are thinking a little bit more deeply and critically about these fundamental issues of government and politics that perhaps they did not give as much thought to in the past. Oh, yes. Uh, in fact, the, I never dreamed that, that I would make such uh, an impact. Um, when I first began what I'm doing now, which was many years ago, uh, I was lucky if I could travel a thousand miles and collect three people in somebody's living room, uh, none of whom, by the way, would help me pay for expenses or anything else, to sit down and listen to what I had to say. And I did this many times, travel all the way across the country, just to talk to two or three or four people in, in somebody's home and uh, and put all the expenses myself. And um, now um, I can go to some place like the Salt Dome in Salt Lake City and and fill the place up with people who want to come and hear what I have to say. Uh, I think the radio broadcast has had a lot to do with it. My book has certainly been the number one uh, underground uh, book in the, in the country for the last uh, eight or nine years and continues to be today. And um, uh, I, I know that, uh, that I'm really hitting the mark and I'm, I'm really making people pay attention when, when the President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton, names me in a White House memo, which Rush Limbaugh read on the air, as being the most dangerous radio host in America. Uh, to me, that was the most tremendous compliment that I could ever receive, was worth more than $50 million, in my estimation. And uh, uh, if, I, if I don't ever do anything more than what I've accomplished, I certainly have accomplished quite a bit in, in the way of waking up the, the average American to stop believing everything that he's told or taught and start questioning and, and using his own mind for something other than, than to hold up the top of his head. And I think that's happening. I think people are beginning to question and think and arrive at their own conclusions today a lot more than they ever have in history. Trusting people is what got us in this situation. And, and the concept, the whole concept that imperfect man can rule other imperfect men and it's going to turn out all right is, is the most ludicrous proposition that I've ever heard in my life. I think there are a number of people that agree with what you say who are aware of some of these facts. Again, the question to ask is, uh, given that there may be ills and abuses on the part of the government today, what would be something that a person interested in seeing change could do? What sort of advice would you give somebody who wanted to have an effect for the better, who would want to 
influence events so that we would begin moving towards a change. There are only two possible avenues of change at, at the present time. One is civil war, which we are heading toward right now. We are rushing toward a civil war in this country. And I foresee that that is probably the most reasonable expectation that we can see happening. Not that I want it to happen. Not that a civil war is reasonable. But it's the reasonable conclusion after looking at the, at the whole picture. The other is that we could somehow really educate the vast majority of what I call the American sheeple. These are people who are ignorant. Ignorant is not a, a bad word. It just means that they're without knowledge. If we could educate them and get them to understand that it is more important to stand up now and take a personal risk and educate other people and say that this has all got to stop and be able to select our own candidates and make sure they get elected, no matter what the press or the television or anybody else tells us about them. Put them in office, people who will support, protect, and defend the Constitution like the like the liars and, and the charlatans who are in office now swear to do when they take their oath of office, but don't at all. Don't even attempt it, in fact. If you could get the people to do that, then there might be a possibility of a political, peaceful solution. But I can tell you right there that that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in your wildest dreams because most people spend the first 21 years of their life trying to get away from daddy and get away from home and become responsible and, and have their own responsibility in life. They spend the rest of their life, once they find out what that really means, in trying to find a daddy that will take care of them and take all the risk away from them and make sure that they have a job and that their diapers are changed and they have a bed to sleep in at night and a place to play and all of that kind of stuff, just like every other child in the world. And to stand up and be responsible and take a risk means that they're not going to find that. That's why socialism is so attractive to the vast majority of any people, not just Americans, but any people. It promises that they're going to have a daddy again who's going to take care of them. If they'll just give up all their rights and all their liberties, daddy will take care of them. And so that's what people are looking for. And you can see it in your daily life. That's the way they vote. That's what they want. They don't want to take personal responsibility. They don't want to take a risk. They're afraid of getting on a list. I've had people tell me to my face, Bill, I know all about this stuff, but I can't help you because I don't want to get on anybody's list. Is it different anywhere else than, Bill? Because this question brings me to something I wanted to ask you anyway, and that is, in looking over other countries in the world, do you find any other countries with social or political models, even if it's only some aspect of their system, that you find worth emulating in, in other countries? Any, any other country or countries that you think go about the political process or the social contract, if you will, uh, in a way superior to the United States? Uh, no, I don't, as a matter of fact. Up until we began to um, to take this, this left turn into socialism, the United States was the, uh, was the great light of the world, so to speak. We were the only free people who had ever existed in the entire history of humanity. The, we, we like to talk about the, our great heritage from England. The English were never free. They're not free today. They don't have freedom of speech. They don't have any of the freedoms that we've always had and cherished. In the history of the whole human race, the only people that have ever lived on this planet who have ever truly been free, the ultimate achievement of all humankind was to accept the individual as a king or queen in his or her own right being responsible and having all of the freedom and liberties that they could possibly imagine right here in this country. And we created a government that was supposed to have a balance of power and was limited, strictly limited by the Constitution 
and only given a very few powers uh, in, in order to protect the freedom of the common man. That's all gone now. I mean, that's like a big... You hear these politicians in Washington today talking about how the Constitution is an outdated document penned over 200 years ago by a bunch of doddering old men who did not understand the complexities of the modern age. They won't tell you what you should already know is that the document is not an outdated old document. It is a living Constitution. It has within it the means for change should the people desire that it be changed. But the people don't desire that, so they just go ahead and throw it in the trash can anyway and go about their business doing anything that they want to do, while Joe Blow on the street doesn't even know that it's happening because he's never read the document that guarantees his freedom in his whole life. So, Mr. Cooper, given the controversial nature of so many of the things that you have studied with regard to government and the law and the abuses thereof. Tell us a little bit about how it has affected your personal life. You're a family man with two children. What kind of impact has the work you've done had on your family? Well, uh, that's, a, that, that's quite an interesting question and that doesn't get asked very much. But uh, uh, it's had... A tremendous effect. If, if you want to find out how quickly um, society can turn against one, and I'm talking seriously here, um, stand up and tell the truth about just anything that you want to stand up and tell the truth about. It scares the living daylights out of everyone. And so the first thing that happens is you find out who your friends are and who your friends are not, because there's a great weeding out there. And it's not anything that you do on your part or that I've done on my part. They just disappear. And um, you find uh, very quickly that people are, are afraid to be around you because uh, that they can see the government um, being upset about what you're talking about, and they can see repercussions coming, and, and of course they have happened and will continue to happen, and, and ultimately I, I, I really believe that there will be some kind of a, of, um, a, a terminal point where they decide that uh, they're not just, just not going to put up with this pest anymore, and, and that's going to be the end of me. Um, we have been um, literally financially in the ditch. We have... Uh, I found it impossible to get any kind of a normal job with anyone who knows anything about what I do. Uh, it's uh, it, it's you can't go to church, you can't go to cocktail parties because everybody else is sitting around talking about the weather or oh, what school did you go to? And and when you when you have um, done the research and arrived at some of the answers that that I know to be true now. Um, those people become like kindergarten children. They, they're not in the real world, and I can't engage in that kind of a conversation. So uh, you really find yourself in another world that has nothing to do with all of the rest of the people who are running around uh, engaged in their activities that they think are so important then. And to them, they really are. But to me... Uh, They've lost the, the reality of what really is important, and they're about to lose uh, the, their freedom to, to even discover those things at this point. I ask you a, a last question, and that is, how would you like to be seen or remembered in future years when people look back and you think about the thrust of your work, what is it that you would like to be best remembered for? I think I would like to be remembered like Paul Revere was remembered. At a time when it was needed and nobody else would do it, I got on my horse and rode through the night and said, the British are coming. And uh, this time it's not the British, although there's an element of the British here because 
England is a socialist country. I'm sure you you know that. Um, that's all. I you know I'm not looking for any fame or any fortune. You certainly don't get rich doing what I'm doing. And uh, infamous is probably the the real word of the that describes uh, what happens to you as far as as uh, as public recognition in a world where political correctness is the theme of the day. Uh, you just don't do what I'm doing. So if anybody wants to remember me, um, I would certainly be pleased if they just remembered I did what was what was the responsible and the right thing to do at a time when nobody else had the guts to do it. Well, Cooper, thank you for your time. You're welcome.